Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Today we have an, another meeting of the Expert Analytical Club. Uh, today we'll discuss the constitutional referendum or the so-called constitutional referendum. Today's session will last two hours. For the first hour, our speakers will ask the, answer the questions. And the second hour is dedicated to the Q&A session. Every participant to today's meeting can take part in, in the discussion. So please raise your hands virtually. Uh, and non-virtually, please let us know if you want to say something and if you want to comment on something, you are welcome, welcome to write in the chat. And my now speakers today is Anatoly Libitska, Svetlana Tikhanovska's representative for the Constitutional Reform and Parliamentary Cooperation, head of the European Dialogue Center. Next uh, is uh, Andrei Kazakevich, PhD in Political Science, director of the Political Sphere Institute. And uh, a little bit later, we'll be joined by Yelena Zhivaglo, the leader of the Honest People campaign. I'd like to remind you that we are recording this session and we still apply the Chatham House rules, which means that uh, in advance, if you don't want to be quoted on something, please let us know. And uh, you will not be quoted on this passage. And then all other participants of discussion will not quote you on this. Also, I'd like to remind you that we have available the English interpretation, simultaneous interpretations of if you, it's easier for you to listen to us in English, please select the relevant option in the Zoom settings. Uh, Vadim Majeka, the floor is yours. Vadim is my co moderator today. Thank you, Anton. Good evening once again, everyone who has joined us today and who will be watching us later on our YouTube channel. Indeed, we were thinking about the topic of the another session of Analytical Club, but the topic was decided on in advance. We don't have referendum every month. Uh, anyway, it's a very important political event, so we would like to discuss today, on the one hand, what is offered, by the Lukashenko's regime and his opponents. What are the plans? What are the proposals on the table during this referendum and around it? And the main thing is who will be the beneficiary of what will happen and what should we expect during the election day? And what's most importantly, what will happen after the referendum? What will happen next in the Belarusian political reality? We will also discuss various approaches to this issue, including the strategy proposed by uh, the Lukashenko's opposition, including the strategy with both, with two crosses. At the beginning, I would like to discuss what are we offered, because this is what we have been trying to avoid, particularly the authorities because sometimes the logic is very simple, either agree or don't. And the information campaign around the referendum was many, in many ways concentrated on how to resist the opponents of the authorities and, uh, uh, and how people are threatened and uh, how the authorities will be fighting extremism. Besides, it's important to understand what are the amendments about? What is offered? to change and to amend. So I would like to start with this point, since it's not discussed by the people who put it on the referendum, it is our duty to do this. So the question is, what are the most important changes and amendments uh, to the constitution? And what do they mean for the political future of Belarus? Uh, let's follow the same order uh, as put in the announcement. So, Anatoly Libetska, you'll be in, have two roles today. The person engaged in the constitution project and a fully fledged politician, as well as the representative of the Svetlana Tikhanovska. I don't know if it will be easier for you or more difficult, but still, the floor is yours. Once again, good evening and uh, thank you for inviting me to this session. Indeed, I believe that this topic is very relevant. However, if we talk about the constitutional project or, or draft that is proposed by the authorities, I think the 
adherents of the authorities did not really read it much and i would risk saying that the majority did not really pay much interest to that because over the last 28 years we've been trained to think that we do not live according to the law or constitution so people understand that whatever is written there it has nothing to do or has very little to do with the reality still the changes on the paper are there i don't know what will happen uh, in future but i don't think there is any future with such amendments another point is that there is a political crisis of and there's a significant sustainable uh, demand for changes that was already then in 2020. The constitutional reform um, has been made according to the very strange uh, approach and it doesn't uh, respond, it doesn't have any response to the requirements for change or the crisis. This is one of the characteristics of today's situation. Indeed, there are some changes that uh, the authorities will probably try to push and the foreign market, uh, like the possibility of a citizen to turn to appeal to the constitutional court and redistribution of the powers, but this redistribution is like putting one thing from one pocket into another, but the content is the same. But in general, I think neither referendum or the no constitutional reform does not bring any change, any significant change on, on the table and our opposition and our stalemate that has been around for not months, but years, shows that on the 20, 28th of February, we will see uh, a Zirk copy or of, of the 7th of February. Well, we also need to note that we still remain the hyper presidential country, or which means that there'll be no privatization in the last 28 years, Alexander Lukashenko, as uh, uh, put his hand on not only agencies, power indices, but also on uh, branches of power. Now, today's the parliament and the constitutional court are like departments of the presidential administration. Uh, this will remain in the new constitution draft. The novelty here, however, is that there will be a addition, additional um, project over the National Assembly while the 110 to 10 deputies are formally elected or voters have some something to do with the election. At least they can come and drop the uh, uh, a piece of paper into the polling booth. The new approach is totally different and it's not connected with any electoral process and this construct that has a function of the so-called parliament looks very strange, very amusing. It's more of a something similar to Iranian model, but not it has nothing to do with the European illegal or political culture. That will be it for me for the introduction. The main conclusion is that there are changes on the paper, but we don't have any political future with such changes. And on the 28th of February, it will be a, a pale copy of what happened in the past. There'll be no significant change in our life as a result of this referendum. Thank you, Anatoly. Andrei, what do you think about this draft? What should be highlighted there? What should be paid attention to? Apart from the marriage being a, a union between the man and a woman. Well, actually, it is already written in the current constitution, so it's not a novelty. It's nothing new. In fact, there are quite a few changes 
I would partially agree with what Anatoly has said, although indeed I agree, absolutely agree with him that the, the constitution may not be followed. Everybody has used to that. Secondly, nobody knows how it will work because the our new model is hybrid and it's exotic. It's not in line with the uh, neither European or worldwide practice, legal practice, universal practice. Very few countries apply in similar models. We can name a few like uh, Iran, Afghanistan, maybe China. We'll see what works in the Belarusian conditions. It's hard to say for now. I don't really agree when they say that uh, we remain a super presidential republic. I even think that it hardly can be called a, a presidential republic. There's a big question about that because the idea here is that if we look at the legal content of the document, the idea of all the changes boils down to one thing. We take away the functions of the various branches of power and give it to the all Belarusian assembly. It's a very mysterious body. We don't know how it will be elected. The constitution doesn't say anything how it will be elected. It's actually uh, made to be appointed by some people. Its function is to provide the Lukashenko's political system with uh, some support for him if he decides to leave. And secondly, not to give any possibilities, any opportunities for changes to come so that the status quo remains and the current ruling class would have some guarantees mechanism of staying in power, even if they lose at some election or something like that. So legally, the idea is to take the powers from one body and give it to the some all people's assembly and politically means as i said to give some support for lukashenko if he decides to leave the presidential post and come up with new mechanisms that would allow to prevent the democratic changes in the country or any changes so what is offered there? Again, I'll be concentrated not only on the political model because I think that all these introductory uh, models uh, are, don't really mean anything because the, the main bodies do not follow the constitution. So we'll talk about politics. So what's about the president there? There are some limitations to his powers, in particularly some decrees uh, of the president are no longer above the law. This is a significant change, as I see it. So while according to the constitution of 1996, the president had the, the biggest power, he was the most powerful person. Now um, he no longer have this legislative power and he will no longer affect the election process because he will no longer be able to appoint the members of the CC and the head of the CC. He is no longer uh, responsible for the judicial powers. So it's the, the old uh, People's Assembly will be responsible for electing the Supreme Court and uh, the CC. So these are the main functions that are taken away from the president. So overall, uh, it's all, all these powers are given to the, the assembly. And also, the assembly will be able to uh, make changes that will be above the law and more than the decree, more powerful than the decree. So, it will be above the law and be. It will be basically a, a new kind of legal act, which is above anything else. 
among other trends, there's a parliament will become more powerful and will, it will be there for five years instead of four. His sessions length will change. The prime minister will be appointed according to the preliminary agreement. So it means that he will not be able to stay there forever. So like it used to be when the president appointed him and everybody agreed. So here we see a change, but we don't know how it will happen in practice. The functions of the chamber will be different. There'll be no decrees of the president, as I said, that are above the law and the Council of Republic they loses the powers on appointing judges on agreeing, on agreeing on the constitutional court uh, judges and half of the CC members. So the parliament loses the control the, on the electoral process and the judicial bodies that it has now. And the parliament is losing one important political function. It is the possibility to initiate an impeachment of the president. We must say that all these powers are given to the old Belarusian assembly. So they took something from the president from the parliament and they gave everything to that assembly. So uh, uh, the, the president and the parliament are getting weaker and all these powers are given to the assembly and we put judicial power, make it, make it, making it dependent on this new assembly. So exactly this is the result of what will happen, what was proposed. It may lead to serious changes, not democratic in character, but the serious ones of the current political model. I don't know how exactly it will work, but probably it will be an interesting thing, an interesting play. It will be a period of some powers being transferred during the next election. It will be accompanied by a period of the mo biggest concentration of the powers when the function and the positions, the post of the president and, and the will be assumed by Lukashenko and uh, you'll be in charge of the assembly as well. Uh, one of the paragraphs openly says about, uh, stipulates that that is that the current president will be able to have two positions at the same time. His positions will be overlapping and basically have more power than he has now. That's in a nutshell. Thank you, Andre. Also, could you add something about the work of the All People's Assembly? Clearly, we don't know how it will work. It's not entirely clear how it will operate. We only know how many, some uh, details, but do you think it will be very loyal? Because all these powers, uh, they are spread along the, a big number of people, even though they're selected among the people who are loyal to Lukashenko. Is this the time bomb for Lukashenko? I think the, the idea is that the, Lukashenko still has control over the CLVT or the law enforcement bodies. And uh, we know that from the post-Soviet history that whoever has access to them and who is in charge of them is in charge of everything. So, so if uh, we don't know how it will happen, how it will work, this assembly will not have any mechanism um, to create parties and to make conspiracies according to the history of such 
practice of such bodies working in other countries show that when there are thousands of people in such assemblies that are appointed, they're very mass, they're very passive. Usually they come, they uh, get their papers and they rubber stamp various laws or something. They don't have any real political leverage as such. So inside this assembly, I don't see any significant any potential split because there must be conditions for that. So we, if system decides to crumble, then it will happen. But in order to consolidate the majority, particularly people from various bodies and agencies, there need to be some special conditions, either representatives of such uh, political parties to get united, getting united together, or some other criteria. Obviously, the presidium and the chairman, chairperson, has a lot of opportunities to split these groups and uh, because those people will not be will be summoned for once, twice a year to vote on something. So I don't think this body doesn't have a serious political prospects. I think the, the main uh, story will be about the possible um, opposition, a conflict between the president and this assembly. I agree with you about the Siloviki. So indeed, he, when person, the president has power over the law enforcement agencies, they have power about, about everything. Indeed, if we, a uh, number of law enforcement agencies are subjected to uh, the assembly, uh, there could be possible conflict between several law enforcement agencies. Anyway, I, I suggest we move to the next point. All these ideas that we've heard now by Andrea Anatoly, all these changes and amendments that may or may not affect the current status quo. Let's go. The question is, who is the beneficiary of these changes and amendments? Is it Lukashenko who formally has more powers or is it Russia who pushes for for some transit of power or is it the Belarusian um, nomenclature? Maybe they want this new assembly to get more powers. Who will be the main beneficiary or beneficiaries of such amendments? Anatoly, what do you think? Well, I'm glad to optimists who are optimistic about the first part of our session. I actually don't see any ground for optimism in the near future. I think during the Q&A uh, in the second hour, we'll go back to this. But as to the beneficiaries, I think there is one, at least one, it is the Kremlin. Lukashenko here made a present to Putin uh, because he took away an article from the Constitution that was about the neutrality of Belarus and the nuclear free status of the country because that was, was the ground for the Russian military to come, to have their bases here. And also now it's possible to create military bases, Russian military bases here with nuclear weapons. So it's an unconditional gift for Putin. Uh, will it satisfy Kremlin? 
the Kremlin, who I think was the main driver of the constitutional reform in Belarus, it wasn't Lukashenko, but Putin, who is behind this constitutional reform, at least to my mind. Will he be satisfied by this? I don't think so. And uh, the latest uh, changes uh, uh, when Russia denied the several years ago, several days ago the loan of 3.5 billion to Russia it shows that Putin wanted more he wanted this uh, computational draft to clearly show the constitutional transfer he wanted to see a path from the toxic Lukashenko to another leader in the future who will be pro-Russian pro-Kremlin but but without the, the bad uh, credit history I think uh, Kremlin still expects more. I think the main beneficiary here is still Putin regarding the bonuses of, of possible military presence in Belarus. And the fact of referendum, I think that for Russia, for Moscow, for the Kremlin, this is an opportunity to, to uh, have uh, an excuse why is Russia still working with Lukashenko? Because, you know, there's a referendum. We didn't look into every uh, ballot paper, but the referendum has been held and uh, the people have shown their will. So the referendum as a whole as, as an event that allows to improve uh, the position of the Kremlin, who sees that the public is thinking worse and worse about uh, the Kremlin because the Putin is openly supporting Lukashenko and it doesn't help to improve the pro-Russian mood in Belarus. I don't think Lukashenko is getting anything in this position. I don't, for him, the referendum is like an additional complication of what is happening is here, he understands that he can hold on to power only with uh, relying on the Siloviki and not through distribution of the powers. He understands that ref referendum does not change the uh, balance of powers inside the country. It means that we have a black and white situation. There's a fixed number of uh, proponents and opponents of the regime. So for him, it's like additional risk. And uh, now in the super intensive regime all the enforcement bodies are, are working uh, now they are tracking all the potential observers and the activists and they're uh, trying to tell people that they need to keep quiet such people that need to keep quiet on the on the referendum day Lukashenko understand that uh, neither in washington or berlin or paris There'll be a statement that there'll be a statement about uh, referendum being le legitimate. The same is true about the Belarus citizens. We are in the in the situation when we have an underground opposition. I think it will continue. Thank you, Anatoly. What do you think about the beneficiaries? Maybe some. There are other potential beneficiaries that I haven't named, the Belarusian people or Ukrainian people, among others. Well, I, I'll tell you who is the formal beneficiary, who I don't know who will get the political dividends at the end. Anatoly has touched on this already. In the 1990s, and later there was a joke that whatever party appears in the post-Soviet space, it's still very much like the Soviet Communist Party. The same is true about this reform. Whatever political reform Alexander Lukashenko comes up with, in the end, will receive something that is closely connected with him. 
and I think the text of the new constitution is and it actually breaks with the message that Lukashenko is the main beneficiary here. Is uh, main guarantees for him, uh, no barriers for him to prevent him from being, being re elected at least a couple of times. While the first constitution of 1996 was created in order to give the uncurtailed power to Lukashenko, the same is here. This reform is for Lukashenko to have a transit of power if the relevant decision is taken. But it doesn't have any duties about this. Any, he can combine the post of the, the president and the chair of the All People's Assembly. So it solves all the issues about the double power. And so I think that the draft was made in, in this, along the same lines based on the political interest of a single person. I don't see any political interest of his inner circle. I don't see any the so-called collective Lukashenko. Uh, the history of how it was um, prepared is interesting. We consider what was already described at the commission in August 2021. The project doesn't didn't really look bad, even formally. It looked like a step ahead compared to the constitution of 1996, at least its version. There was some limitation of powers, a strengthened parliament, the functions of the constitutional court were improved, changed, amendment amended. So it was the next it is another step to the separation of powers. But then in the fall and winter of 2021, there were some tune-ups to cater for the interest of a single person. The, they come up with mechanisms for him to stay in power, or even if everything goes haywire, if he lose the election and the parliament lose the election and the president lose the election to um, turn back, to make a step back. So all the potential changes could be connected with this. As the way the pro project is now, the main beneficiary here is Alexander Lukashenko and the rest is secondary. It's obvious that the atmosphere surrounding the referendum is a taking bomb for the political model that will follow it, because it will not be recognized by the international community and the majority, or maybe at least some citizens of Belarus. Maybe Russia would want something more transparent. So maybe Russia will not be so happy about it. And the authorities don't, Belarusian authorities don't show any understanding of the political future or political ideas. It looks like they don't have energy or time to think about it and uh, Everything is done hap haphazardly and it's not suited to the interest, uh, actually suited to the interest of a single person. Thank you, Andre. Could you add something about uh, what you said? Why? Uh, the if local deputies end up in the assembly or some representatives of the fake civil society, if they end up in the assembly, why they are not beneficiaries? Because it's very much looks like what they had wanted for a while. So maybe 
it looks like that they would get another push and another stimulus and a platform to express their opinion. We don't know how this border will be formed. Of course, it will be. It was possible to combine interests of various groups. Then, uh, something like this may happen. But I think everything will boil down to the list approved in the by the presidential administration, and that that will be the end of it. So. Uh, it will look like the people inside this assembly will not be people to that would make problems well, will constitute a problem it will be a formal body for them to get around and vote for something or rubber stamp something we'll see how it goes but at least what, that's how i see it now in the last six months since august last year when they the news about this draft emerged. It was very much about thinking how to make this body still closed uh, and not particularly connected with political interests. Secondly, uh, when you're one of the thousands of people, how can you uh, impact or affect the key decisions. It's not so easy because even an MP, a parliamentary, cannot really affect much. Uh, what could uh, one of 110 people influence? So it's more complicated in this case, I mean, more complicated in this case. We'll see how it goes, as I said, because it will already, was already said many times that it's about creating the loyal civil society and uniting the structures, the loyal structures involving law and people, friends and relatives. There were promises to have a reformer in implementing the reform of the electoral system and to involve party lists. But we see the system on the element of the candidate withdrawal, or deputy withdrawal still remaining. Also, the, the creation of new party system was not initiated. I think it was mentioned at the end of 2020 or 2021, when uh, many patriotic organizations and party of the, of the regime could play a major role here. It was all paused. So the the, men, the amendments, they're not a barrier for the assembly not to, to become a, a body that will play into the hands of Lukashenko. And we don't see any potential for that. I just thought that the structuring of the gong into the formal civil society will not be to the taste of these people. Clearly, now they work in, in line with the model and, and the framework of the organizations and concepts. And this, in this case, they will be put into a vertical and not everyone will be happy with that. I already uh, see people discussing the future project. For example, the law enforcement officers will have to go through an inspection and there will be changes in the draft and we don't know how it will pan out. Those who will get education abroad well, may not get uh, any substantial position because they may be foreign spies, something like that. So I agree that what is uh, being discussed these days will not be to the taste of the people uh, which are formally, which are, which are forming the loyal civil society.
So uh, interesting that uh, uh, Foreign Minister McKay uh, started in the Vienna Academy of Diplomacy. We'll see uh, what what the uh, what will happen with him. Anyway, we'll now mm, move to the more pleasant point. Not so much. We'll discuss the pluses and minuses of the authority strategy and that of the opponent. It'll be interesting to understand what the strategy in fact is. And uh, it'll be interesting to discuss the strategy with the two crosses. What do you think are the strongest and weakest sides of this? Because very often journalists ask me about this and whether it's a good strategy or not. But that's one thing. Uh, but another thing is to understand what are the strong and weak suits of this approach. Anatoly, we'll start with you. I'm not actually an author of this strategy, so my approach will also be external from outside. But if we talk uh, about what is done by the thought is now and the proponents of the democratic changes, we'll, we can say that they are forced to do that. I'm still convinced that Lukashenko very often asks himself, Alexander, why do you need all this trouble? He wasn't the initiator of the referendum, and I firmly believe that this idea got crystallized during the protests that uh, took place in Belarus in 2020. And in Sochi, when Lukashenko was, looked very much uh, like a limping duck, a duck limping on both feet. Uh, Vladimir Putin told him what to do. And it was important for Putin that the protest would not move outside Belarus. So the Smolensk and Bryansk region uh, all around the Russian Federation it was important to take the people off the streets. Um, and since the Kremlin had some experience of holding a referendum, uh, this similar approach could solve this issue. That's why they pushed for it. And for the Kremlin was the potential of uh, seeing the transit of power and gradual removal of Lukashenko from the main position. So it had to be done. Indeed, Lukashenko did not initiate referendum. He was not happy about this. And as was mentioned here, the constitution was amendment amended because I think I'm convinced that Lukashenko was a uh, in charge of the amendments. I think he was uh, making changes to the text. He was motivated to do that. He had some phobias about this. He's had them since 1996, when after the failed impeachment in Lukashenko was so afraid, so he made the impeachment strategy or procedure impossible to implement. Uh, just like Andrei mentioned recently, the project is very much affected by the phobias of Lukashenko. So he changed it in the way that nobody would understand. Nobody understands what what happened in the end. For him, he understands now that neither the constitutional draft nor the final text give him any guarantees. The guarantees for him are by the fear in the society, by the monolith of the law enforcement bodies and the full, the total control over all the people inside of his country. This is what he bets on and not the constitutional referendum. Therefore, the strategy, of course, has its drawbacks because uh, uh, they have to involve political wrestling, uh, foul play, and play without rules. So if some of our citizens think that a legitimization of this process may happen, 
I asked them the question. In the best of times uh, in the past, Lukashenko couldn't sell it, at least uh, abroad in the foreign markets. It was a failure everywhere. And they, uh, foreign experts said that it was, uh, wasn't in line with international standards. So selling the new draft is impossible. And the thing is, it's impossible to sell even inside Belarus. And that's actually the main drawback for Lukashenko. And the final result will him be as follows. Neither international community nor international organizations or uh, the majority of the citizens inside the country will perceive it as the just or legitimate process. When the opportunity arises, they will try to move away from it and say that this is not about us, we have nothing to do about it. As to the proponents of the changes, uh, the opposition and democratic forces, the weakness here is that uh, the national NAM and Tikhanovsky's office have no voice in that. It's not their strategy from the very beginning. They had to reflect on what was done. So this is their weakness. And they have to re reply and to react to what was done. So the choice is quite, quite limited here. They have to choose the best from everything that is not particularly uh, successful. I think that the passive boycott and would be more appropriate for the authorities. They don't have to force to make that 80,000 members of the PCs because it's a big stress. Even in 2020, it was difficult to mobilize these people and they still have this shock. And now the electoral code needs to be violated and uh, publication of the PC members are not published. It's a direct violation of the legislation that was written to favor Lukashenko and the authorities. So the most positive thing in this strategy of the double cross strategy is that the protest remains. It is visualized and uh, using the platforms are we possible to show that the there is still big number of people who are against Lukashenko. And there are many more of them than the proponents of his regime. I think that's quite a pragmatic result. It has some minimal, but still positive emotions. This is how I see it. I see it as a me forced measure for Lukashenko and the proponents of changes. And again, I make this, the conclusion that we'll see a struggle. Lukashenko doesn't want to see anything significant happening at this polling station or any significant activity there, but he would allow for people to come and put two crosses there. The, the authorities cannot influence that. They can limit the number of participants. They have cut off the people outside the country. Again, this shows that the, the authorities want to control the situation as much as possible. Well, they may put some people in prison for 10 or 15 days. And again, pinpoint some activists and then make some law officers to change the potential activists their minds, but they need to let people inside the police stations, give them the voting paper. And uh, nobody knows what is a person will put in mark how they will mark this bulletin. Uh, 
So again, we'll see that uh, there are many more opponents to Lukashenko than his proponents. Thank you, Natoli. I remember uh, then uh, how in, in 2020, uh, what they, they involved the emergency ministry officials to into the polling and to voting process. I think, and now the CLVK will, or enforcement agencies will accompany the representatives of the mobile voting group. Andrei, what do you think about the both strategies? Is it a necessity? What are the weak and strong points here? I think the strategy of the authorities is quite clear. They bet on, uh, made a bet on the uh, law enforcement bodies. Uh, I don't see any particular interest uh, of authorities in changing people's minds. They will probably fake the final figures rigged election. I agree with people who say that the authorities want to avoid any turmoil, any visual inconsistencies. And I think the main weakness lies here as well. Because indeed, in order to solve the issue of legitimacy, this referendum will have to be another step ahead, but will be a step in the opposite direction. Alexander Lukashenko has been in power after some questionable referendum. And now the whole system is put under question, in, into question, because the, the new constitution will not be recognized by the majority of the Belarusian people and the Western international community and Western society. It's obvious that the majority of Belarusians are not particularly enthusiastic about that. There is some irritation and tension growing towards the authorities, the opponents of the authorities, particularly those of the, the active ones. They may have forgotten what was happening in 2020, but they keep being reminded through repressive actions that uh, they are considered uh, not particularly reliable and safe for this for the regime. Uh, this doesn't really help to stabilize the situation. And the weakness of this strategy is that The new kind of warfare, like a trench warfare, is not going away. And I don't think the referendum will help us solve this. As to the democratic forces and their stance on what is happening, in fact, it was hard to come up with some optimal solutions the logic of the voting and put to crosses that is quite clear and understandable. When you come and vote against, it may mean that you're in favor of the current constitutional system and the current president, which is not great. Not coming to the polling station means showing an exhibiting political passivity. And uh, many people don't go there because they're not interested and they're not against. And putting two crosses in a vote and slip, it is a political step, which means that this person will do something 
that has a protest inside to it. It may also have additional effect if this vote and slips will be read and calculated. And some member of the commissions of the PCs will see the huge number of people who are against the current regime. And obviously, this is not something that will change the situation. But anyway, it's it's much better than uh, when people don't come at all from the point of view of the democratic forces, at least. Uh, it's much better uh, than if people don't vote against it. So this strategy is, seems quite optimal, the strategy of mobilizing political forces during the referendum. As to the weak points, they are that the campaign is held during the very tight political pressure, strong political pressure and the political repression, which started in the summer of 2020. The media space was uh, particularly affected, negatively affected. It's now almost impossible to conduct any activities inside the country, oppositional activity, I mean. Um, inside the country, the activities that it, used to be considered politically safe or neutral, like observation or, or elect, election observation. Well, holding a session of the analytical club was also considered safe. And now it's not safe. Now it's all been, it's no, it, it all can fall under the category of the criminal persecution, or at least administrative persecution. prosecution. It, as a result, many people don't understand what is happening, what needs to be done at this referendum. And some people don't understand why they need to come and make and spoil the, the ballot paper. And because of the broken communication channels and media channels. And since a lot has changed regarding the possibilities of communicating with the societies and getting the message across, it wasn't particularly very detailed for the people. Besides, as uh, we can see, as a result of some surveys, we understood that The, there is a propaganda in place. Maybe not propaganda, but the information policy of the authorities. Uh, for example, they launched a, a fake news that the spoiling the ballot papers is illegal. People can be pro prosecuted for that, even though the legislation doesn't have say anything about that. So some people now think that they can be prosecuted for this. And the authorities said that the, the polling stations will be equipped with cameras that will help find the person who had, has spoiled the ballot paper. I guess this information was put in the media space on purpose. Of course, this weakens the possibility of mobilizing people. And the general atmosphere is not particularly conducive to this. Uh, obviously, the authorities have been success in sowing fear. Even in the working places, people don't really talk much about polit politics. Uh, they avoid expressing their opinions. And in this case, it's hard to hope that the appeals of the democratic forces will be greeted with enthusiasm. Even though 
a lot has been done in this respect and hopefully we'll see some positive results there thank you andre well it'd be great to uh, have the next point more optimistic anyways we have mentioned we've discussed the strategies the approaches to the voting process but now let's think about what will happen on the election day uh, let's think about the atmosphere and let's think how the referendum will affect the situation inside the country and what how will it affect will affect what is happening in the west in the east will we see more people coming trying to spoil belt papers uh, more people being afraid to come in person and uh, hoping for some electronic channels sending their vote and will we see moscow being happy uh, with the referendum or not so what how do you think referendum will be held and do you think it will change the moods anatoly please i think on the eve of the referendum we'll see some uh, celebrations of the law enforcement agencies and We'll see some arts and crafts exhibited in all the polling stations from Brest to Orsha. We'll see people dancing there. And uh, we'll see the, the desires of Belarusians being satisfied in terms of they will see the some fruit and vegetables sold at a very good prices. At first, we'll see the predominance of the terror and fear there'll be some arrests it will be done publicly but on the very day there will be a, a feast uh, during the plague as they call it as far as the mood is concerned again I started with that on the 28th of February, it will be a, a carbon copy of uh, 27th. It, uh, this trench warfare will remain. And we see that neither Lukashenko nor his opponents have resources and powers to say that uh, they are winners, they're total winners. It's not there, which means that there will be a foreign factors playing big major role in a influence in the fate of Belarusians. It will be interesting to see how four external actors will comment on what will happen in Belarus for the Russia. For Russia it will be uh, it will be a chance to bleach their policies in Belarus because in saying after 2020, uh, that Lukashenko was elected by the majority of voters was um, hard even for Russians. So now they're trying to uh, find a new um, support to, to his position and referendum could, might as well play this part. And now we know that maybe not 70%, but 53% of uh, voters supported Lukashenko. I think Lukash uh, Russia will try to bleach and uh, their, or justify their weak position in Belarus. It's important for Russia not to see the growing anti-Russian mood. And if Belarusians see that Putin helps Lukashenko fight against their own people, it'd be hard to um, 
justify Russian's position. As to the West, I think the reaction will be much tougher than it was during the previous referendum and electoral campaigns. I think that prior to the election, the Venetian Commission will make the first conclusion about the political system and it will be very important. An important opinion, an important token, because it's a, a supreme uh, arbitrage. I think there'll be uh, several attempts to go back to the electoral reforms. I don't think it will be dominating, but uh, will be on the agenda. If we uh, go back to the old people's assembly, I think uh, some vote, some um, laws will be adopted before that. We don't know what will happen then. So we don't know how it's regulated. This topic will remain on the, on the agenda. I think in March, the mission uh, commission will make the second, will issue the second statement, and in June will be the final statement about the uh, constitution draft and on possible draft issued by the uh, democratic forces. So it will be able to discuss what was pushed onto us by Lukashenko and the company. We'll have more information in hand and we'll see how it works in practice. Although I believe that not much will change and we'll discuss that during the Q&A session. On the 28th, we'll see the Kachanova sitting on to the right and Andrei Shitka sitting to the left of Lukashenko. And um, the parliament having new powers, they will still uh, listen to what Alexander Lukashenko will say to them, just like it used to be, actually. So at least I, I think this is what happened, what will happen in the short term, let alone the middle term and long term. Anyways, uh, a, lot a lot of interesting things will happen uh, uh, about Russia, regarding Russia. It's already started with Lukashenko plan his visit to Moscow. Uh, Moscow will bet on the crawling integration, uh, which means that they'll be trying to gradually bite uh, uh, some economic interest piece by piece, and the issue of the military basis will be discussed, not only de facto, but the level of the intergovernmental agreement. I think they will discuss the creation of the subnational um, will be it will be something that Putin will be interested in on the eve of his electoral campaign and we so, shouldn't expect any unexpected steps from uh, Russia after the referendum of this so-called referendum which uh, is not a referendum as such Thank you very much, Anatoly. Andrei, what do you think will happen? And uh, how do you think various actors will react to this? Well, I think the referendum will be held uh, according to the scenario that the authorities came up with uh, basically saying that we don't care what you think, but we don't want any uh, visual protest. Um, we don't care whether you trust the uh, electoral commissions or us. Most importantly, we must sign everything and you not getting anywhere you'll follow our decisions and our orders. You'll follow the new constitution and the new political reform. What happens next is a big question. It's hard to forecast. 
предложить будет многие интересные какие-то моменты, потому что some interesting things uh, are ahead, I think, because on the one hand the constitution presupposes a political reform. There must be passed a decision on what a civil society is. The authorities have already spoken on that. They said it's important to pass the adopt the relevant law. Civil society is even mentioned in this constitution, hence the importance. Um, how it will happen, what it will be is a big question. It will be a long-term game because many will see an opportunity here, an opportunity to strengthen their position, to grow in terms of their career promotion. But many people and at the same time, a lot of people in the vertical will favor the status quo. They're more worried about their pension and they're not keen on the new political vertical appearing. Of course, they'll try to torpedo that, to tackle that, like they did in 2007, when the idea of the, uh, the regime party emerged. There will also be an issue with the political parties, whether to develop them or not. Uh, the formation of the assembly is also unclear it needs to be done in the in the current year the next question will be about the next election that will be in 2024 in two years time on the one hand there is a there is a pause on the other hand there's not much time left and uh, the big question is whether to follow the new scenario or the old one whether more power should be given to the loyal staff or not, because you cannot, can never be 100% sure of their loyalty. Uh, I have an impression that there's no a clear cut vision on the part of the authorities about this. There's some emptiness. And the only thing they are successful at is to manually manage it. They can plan for six months ahead, 12 max, months max, but not, not much. I think this will be the scenario for them. And they hope that there will be a economic growth and the social tension will dissipate, and disappear. The people will we used to go to the streets, take to the streets. Now they are discussing it in the kitchen. They're unhappy about it, and hopefully they will forget about it soon. Those of you following the discussion in the among the pro-government experts will clearly see that uh, this is something that they're discussing, and they hope that it will last for six months. But uh, turned out to last more for eighteen months. But anyway. The main rule of the game is, if you're not happy, you need to leave. I think it will develop in the manual mode without the long-term planning and will be about a quick reaction to, to the situation. There are two factors to my mind uh, that are key here that uh, can seriously affect the internal situation, situation inside the country. First is the economic um side of because if there is an economic growth the authorities will not think that something is that anything is wrong that uh, a compromise needs to be made and a dialogue needs to be engaged in so if we go back in history we will understand that Lukashenko has always trying uh, has always tried to play the democracy card and improve his relationship with the west when the economy was suffering 
So I think the economy will play a major part, a major role, because psychologically, it's for Lukashenko, the, for the ruling elite is very important. I think the boldness that they exhibited in 2021 was due to the economic growth, even though there were voices that saying that the country would fail economically. If something like that happens in the future, they will act the same. And the second factor is very much about the relationship between the Rus Russia and the West, an external one. If there's a confrontation, Lukashenko will be useful for the Kremlin, whatever he does here. It's been obvious in the last six months, actually. But if the status quo changes, if there's a pause or a detente or whatever, which seems uh, impossible now, but cannot be excluded. But if we think what happened was happening a year ago in the relationship between Russia and the US and the West, we would understand it was different. There were some expectations. So if there is a an, a thaw or a warming of relationship, if the tension goes away, then there'll be desire to keep the status quo. I mean, this desire to keep the status quo in Belarus will go away. And uh, maybe the situation in Belarus could be affected through the Kremlin. It could be another important factor for new dynamics to resurface. Well, that's basically it for me. Thank you, Andre. Uh, what do we think of this scenario? We'll see that the future is not particularly bright for Belarus. Well, that's exactly what is happening. We can see that the legitimacy, both internal, external, and uh, national, international, is not uh, is actually important. And the fact that Belarus, Lukashenko, has become weaker is a fact. That he has lost his legitimacy abroad is a, this is also a fact. Fine. Uh, I guess our third expert has not joined us. Which leaves us more time for discussion. Right now, I uh, urge everyone who is here with us uh, who would like to make a remark or make a comment about our discussion today to do this. Please raise your hand. And Anton will help me to determine who's done this, who's doing that. Anton, do you have anyone? who wants to make a remark or ask a question. Tatiana has written in the chat that finding people in the commission is difficult. So the, there will be other people on the commissions that they uh, compared to the 2020. Maybe somebody wants to add something, uh, particularly those present here. I mean, the analysts, diplomats or I uh, would like to add, say the following, as to the, uh, the amended constitution, Belarus still remains in terms of formal governments, the uh, country with super presidential powers. And uh, what I mean here is that if we look at the text, the president still remains the head of the state and president, the president is in in charge of the legislation or legislative legislature and he is uh, he can have a lot of powers of the popular assembly while he was sitting on the two chairs in the past he now has the third chair under him but nothing really changes much. Lukashenko can combine his position of the president with the chair of the old Belarusian assembly. So in the near future, 
nothing will change for him. He retains the same super, super authorities that he used to have. One in three faces. This is what we have at the end, in the end. So it's definitely, definitely, definitely not about him getting weaker or transferring in authority to someone. We'll see how it goes, but in many ways, many powers were transferred based on not on objective necessity or a need, but based on the person in charge of this agency. I think the Chamber of Representatives, even though it's supposed to be elected by the people, it doesn't play its role. Ms. Kachanova, who has the role of trust from Lukashenko, is ruling there. We know that Kachanova basically changed his mind when he wanted to leave the, his presidential post. Well, I would uh, disagree here because the Chamber of Representatives has not lost formally any of its functions in terms of its appointment. Basically, the Chamber of Representatives has become bigger. Uh, uh, and more powerful. But in terms of appointment, uh, it's still the same. The Council of Republic, National Council, I think did lose its powers in terms of their control over the CC and its membership, the Constitutional Court, the Supreme Court. So I don't really think that there's any play here that Kachanova has received some new powers. But the Constitutional Court indeed received some new powers, uh, possibility of recognizing constitutional, non-constitutional nature of the election, and so on and so forth. And the acting chair is also the chair of the commission. Uh, in terms of everything else, I think that we cannot uh, objectively say that it happened. In terms of Belarus being still super presidential republic, I also would not agree that with that. This um, all people's assembly is breaking all the forms of governments like parliamentary, presidential, and so on. On the one hand, the president still retains a lot of powers. On the other hand, there's a body, so-called the Old People's Assembly, and they can give orders or instructions to all other bodies, including to the president. So something, a body can give uh, instructions to the president, which is quite serious. Also, it's a a body that uh, can make decisions that are binding for the president, at least on the paper. Uh, at the same time, this body can impeach the president and can uh, um, recognize legitimacy, non legitimacy of presidential election, and so on and so forth. So it may look like a presidential republic, but with uh, a new center of gravity which has been moved so i definitely wouldn't call it a super presidential republic because indeed at least formally the, the presidential powers have been undercut and undermined we may not call it fully presidential either anymore although from a political point of view, this contradiction is uh, solved in the sense that Lukashenko can combine his two posts and uh, respectively have more powers than uh, he currently has. We spoke today about Iran and similarity there. 
and I thought that it would be difficult for me to compare Iran here because Iran is special in this respect. And uh, so in, indeed it's difficult to come up with a term to describe what is happening in Iran and politically. You have mentioned in passing the fact that the constitutional court will recognize or will not recognize the election. The All People's Assembly will judge on the legitimacy and on the legitimacy. I don't really un fully understand what kind of procedure is that and how the statement that the election was uh, legitimate or not is political. I know there is a legal procedure and I can imagine that, but I don't think there's anything like that available worldwide. I don't think anybody can recognize something which uh, is non legitimate. Indeed, this is a very hazy uh, notion. There is some legitimate thing, a non legitimate, but um, well, I mean, legal and uh, illegal, but what about being legitimate, non legitimate? It sounds quite strange. And uh, whether the election was in tune with, uh, in line with the Constitution. That's also a big question and also a vague thing, big description. So again, it shows how much, how vague the idea of this new order is, how difficult it is to understand what will happen because it's a mixture of everything. So it's unclear what is meant by this. It's blurred. It's a model that potentially is non-functioning, non-operating. I'm in here legally, so probably it will be very much based on the governed by some internal rules. Well, we may meet it in a similar way six months from now, and many things will be more obvious for us. But my forecast is clear. The president will be dominating, which means that the decisions about the country and its future and about the 9,350,000 people will be taken by him every day. And this very specific assembly, if they get together once a year for several days, will not be able to affect the everyday life of people, which means the financial side and social side and legal framework. This will all be decided by Lukashenko through uh, his working meetings. Everyone mentioned here will be joining him at his, resident, at his residence and will be given some instructions by him and will be imposing this orders instruction on us. And this construct is un unmanageable, the 1200 people it's very difficult to describe how it will function and operate, particularly if they're put together. Assemble for a day or two it will be more of a propaganda move. And uh, statistically, there will be 35% of women, 25% of young people, and that many people from rural areas and urban areas and so on. So there will be no real influence exercised by this assembly and uh, Lukashenko, everything remains the same. He uh, used to be uh, the owner of the 100% of shares of uh, Belarus LLC, and he will remain this way. The intrigue, uh, what the 
the intrigue here was that that Russians said, you know, you will still be in charge, but give some shares to some other people from your near circle. For many days they were discussing this, but in the end, Lukashenko never gave up a single share. He retained the 100% of shares to himself. The, so it's a super powers constructed in the single hands. This system remains unchanged. And what we see here is a decoration present at the stage. But the time will tell. And in a while, we'll be able to get together once again and remember today's discussion and we'll see the result. Indeed, if the law is passed in half a year and the law on and this assembly will have a lot to talk about, a lot to discuss. I think Andrei Kazakevich will rejoin us soon. But there was a question in the chat. When Natalia was speaking about the presidential figure being dominated, the main thing is that it will be still Lukashenko. For a number of reasons, we still used to the fact that Lukashenko is the president. It's interesting to imagine what will happen if Lukashenko goes away and he remains the president of the or chair of the, the assembly, but not the president. So he will still have some powers, but not the presidential powers. There was a question in the chat regarding this as well. So when Lukashenko becomes the chair of the assembly and when the referendum results will be enacted is the question from the chat so when will this be fulfilled could you repeat this please so the question is when will lukashenko become the chair of the people's assembly and when the changes connected with this referendum will be will come into force well the changes will come into force the next presidential election so if lukashenko abruptly decides to change uh, to leave the presidential position and the new president needs to be elected something interesting may happen then but other than that the model that has been proposed but uh, doesn't make any restrictions but give them some new scenarios for further political work thank you Natoli, what do you think i believe that only under certain pressure there could be a synergy of the economic crisis, uh, rethinking of what is happening in the Kremlin and um, some bonuses, rather some bonuses from the West for Russia, not particularly supporting Lukashenko that much. If all this happens together, then the law, then Lukashenko will take a pen or pencil and drafts the new law there could be some potential change because psychologically Lukashenko is nothing like Nazarbayev Lukashenko is the person who wants to fully control the situation and I don't think Lukashenko will be able to get rid of it there have, have not been many examples like that an experiment involving IT sector is something that Lukashenko did 
when he gave up certain control. I think after the events of August 2020, he said to himself, "What? Well, come on, old fool, you um, let them outside your control and see what happened. These golden eggs are there, but the political results and politically it presented negatively for him. So I think he uh, will try to keep the 100% control and it's the only thing that will allow him to retain power. For him, it will be a difficult choice, but he, he may want to put a loyal person to the post of the president and uh, give the old people's assembly some powers and maybe give its presidium as i because i repeat it's difficult to organize 1200 people and the presidium or general committee when there are seven to ten people then uh, part of your inner circle will be much easier to control and the law enforcement agency or uh, element will be very important in this respect. We may see something like this even before autumn. And then Lukashenko may leave with uh, certain guarantees. Well, I don't think other than that, I think they'll be, they will pub publish the results of the referendum in the um, state press. And they will describe, describe when the changes will come into force. Well, anyway, I think within half a year, the all on the All People's Assembly will be enacted because if it doesn't happen, there'll be no body as such. Mr. we still have some time. So we don't have, since we don't have any questions, oh, well, we have a question. Anais Marian, who is a special rapporteur. Hello. Um, my special report on Belarus will be about a potential uh, influence on the, the new constitutional draft on the main rights and liberties of Belarusians. Well, my question is, what liberties will be affected and will it be for the better or for worse? A lot can be said about that, but I think the main point here, at least for me, is that they actually worsen the situation with the human rights in Belarus. First is that there is a body that will not be elected by the people that receive, will receive a lot of powers. Consequently, the rights of people to elect like, the representatives and the authorities will suffer and will be limited as a result, including by the fact that the, this body can um, recognize legitimacy and non-legitimacy of the election and affect uh, the CC members and uh, elect them and many other ways to control the electoral process. So while in the past, the electoral process was not democratic, now this will be even less transparent, less democratic, even less informally and will be less connected with the will of citizens. Besides, there are points that are difficult to call democratic like uh, there'll be the notion of the Belarusian state ideology as the foundation of the political regime. So the authorities are given up on the pluralism of the ideology. And what they're saying is that there'll be a single ideology. There'll be uh, urged as the only one and imposed as the single one. During his uh, latest address, Alexander Lukashenko said that 
вот он, в принципе, и не смог на прямой ответ. Well, actually, he couldn't answer the question about the idea of the Belarusian democracy. Well, he started, he, he got a bit lost there, and it was obvious that there's no clear -cut ideology, but there is some, something, some idea promoted for everyone. And it's quite alarming because it shows that some measures will be taken and will be justified by the constitution. Uh, meaning that the uh, single ideology can be introduced and imposed um, and with it will be the control and other uh, parts of the constitution they presuppose the stronger control a bigger control of the authorities on the people uh, and um, probably the pluralism will be dealt with. There'll be limitations on what, on who can be elected this president after the uh, referendum. The changes will be a person who has lived in Belarus for 20 years, who has not, who never lived outside of Belarus had never lived outside the Belarus, never had a, a document like the Polish card, or never had a residence permit of another country. It's difficult to see, consider it a democratic norm. And it's clear uh, whom it, it's tuned for and whom it's adjusted for. So the changes will be either neutral or bad um, for the human rights. Thank you, Andre. Anatoly, could you, do you have anything to add? Indeed, I will add that as far as I understand as to the question, if there, there'll be analysis of the provision regarding the rights and liberties, and my proposal is that for this analysis to be comparative the the new draft for the belarus and the Alexander lukashenko's constitution because uh, the the new constitution draft presupposes the uh, more rights and liberties for the citizens it's about one third of the draft and we thought it was very important to uh, describe the powers and the, of the citizens and which will give more preferences to the people and the new legal state. As to the pro-governmental draft, as was rightly noted by Andrzej, as far as the state ideology, this could be the, the foundation for the massive violation of human rights it will affect children because uh, there will be a centralized approach affecting schools will be a big challenge also i would note that the constitutional draft presupposes the introduction of the new of various limitations regarding the information and how it's processed received and uh, distributed various taboos and various bans will be in place also in special cases people will may lose their citizenship the social responsibility and the notion of it is quite vague i agree that uh, the new draft is either neutral or will make the rights uh, and liberties of people weaker and it will negatively affect them. If we consider the, the role that is played by the government and the play, uh, the priority here is uh, 
towards this state. Like Andre said, uh, whatever party appears, it's similar to the Communist Party. And uh, in case of Belarus and whatever happens, it's very much about the past and the, uh, the single person and the, his inner circle. Right. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, for this question on the future report. In conclusion, I would like to ask a question, a provocative question. What do you think will be the name of the new president in case there is a political transit? The name. That's a provocative question, a humorous one. Andre is related laughing. I'm not going to answer this question. Um, you know, so you I mean you're not ready? There are several norms in the new constitution that uh, are supposed to improve the the right the rights of uh, strengthen the rights of people. I mean, like appeal to the constitutional court. Yes, indeed. It turns out that people have a right to directly turn to the court, Supreme Court, and the rights of the handicapped people, people with disabilities are also described there. So this will be an improvement, seen as an improvement. I would like to see the future election to be held according to the constitution of the new Belarus. This is definitely not the challenge or the risk of the country for the political system. This is more of a uh, weights and balances system, checks and balances system. And if this happens, I will be glad to see Svetlana Tikhanovska, Masha Kolesnik, Viktor Babarika, and hundreds of other people who are didn't uh, could represent their country in the international arena. They could play a major role here. Well, basically, my provocative question was about uh, about understanding who would say Natalia or Svetlana. Okay, jokes aside, I guess we see a question in the chat. If there are some amendments made after the referendum, uh, will there be any mechanisms rolled back? What uh, these issues of power will be formal? Well, basically, I don't think you uh, the no nothing will have to be rolled back because what will be held is not referendum it will not be held by legitimate forces and powers and it's not uh, uh, in line with the referendum criteria described by the international documents and international organizations so it's all Ill illegitimate legal i think we should have started our discussion with that basically decided on terminology. What will happen is the special operation on, of holding on to power or an attempt to uh, get insurance to prolong the staying in power and, and in office. It cannot ha have legitimate consequences either for Belarusian citizens or the international community. So no special procedures should be described. It's very important to note this. Should be noted by the organized structures that unite uh, the proponents of the democratic change and the international organizations. If this, if this doesn't happen, we may end up with uh, signing certain agreements that lead to the liquidation of the country of Belarus as such. If we today all agree on illegitimacy of the upcoming events, will be a foundation on which we can not rec recognize the, these events. 
would say that it will depend on how long it will last. Let's imagine that a long time will pass before um, any changes will become possible. New institutes, institutions will be created and will be operating. A legal base will be created. It will not be that easy to cancel all this. It will be a, quite a, a political task. The best thing will be to hold a new referendum according to the new constitution as SAP and uh, also to hold the election or do it simultaneously. The election into all main bodies, I mean the parliament, the president, will be great to do it as fast as possible, not to put off the question of deciding of the political mo model indefinitely. Even though this cannot be, I mean, the upcoming referendum cannot be considered legitimate or fully le illegal. Even though, despite all this, it will not be particularly easy to uh, roll everything back and it will be better to do it through the new referendum so that the new model would cancel and replace the old one and be a foundation for the new democratic system. So I totally agree with Andre who said that it would be great to hold the new democratic referendum as soon as possible. But as far as Anatoly's words are concerned, that uh, that it's important to totally agree that the upcoming referendum is illegal. I cannot guarantee that, but the minutes of uh, analytical club, I have noted this thought there. Anyway, thank you everyone for joining us today. We'll definitely discuss the consequences of the upcoming referendum and any laws about the All People's Assembly. Uh, Andrei Anatoly, hopefully we'll meet in six months time. Uh, but we know that we will discuss it much earlier. We'll have an, a lot of things to discuss already in March. So thank, thank you everyone. And uh, we'll see you at the next session of Expert Analytical Club. For those of you who will watch us on YouTube or channel of Press Club, please subscribe to our channel, not to miss our future sessions and broadcasts. Thank you very much. Thank you and goodbye.